What's going on, folks? It's your boy Javier Javier with the Javier Javier Show. Make sure you say it twice. I got a special guest, Dustin, here with me, and we're going to talk about the two parties and how to fix them. So, welcome, Dustin. How are you? You know, introduce yourself, tell people a little bit about you. Hey, Javier. Uh, thanks for having me on. My name is Dustin Aaron. I'm, uh, I'm a lawyer by training, but I've been a stay at home dad for almost nine years now. Um, I'm, bit of a amateur philosopher I guess in the meantime and uh and I met you hanging out on some Facebook groups and we've had some interesting discussions so I'm glad to be on the show with you to talk about uh ways we might reform the political system awesome awesome so you're a lawyer by trade and you've been a stay-at-home father for nine years how mm -hmm. how did that how did that come about <laughs> basically um uh my wife got a job down in DC after she graduated law school. And um, <clears throat> I was doing some kind of the lawyer's equivalent of gig work down there. I had a clerkship in Massachusetts while she was in school, but then when that ended, we moved to DC. Um, I basically took the lawyer's equivalent of, of gig work while I was looking for a permanent thing. But then the, the twins came along and it was like, well, I could, you know, click a mouse for eight hours and pay someone else to watch my kids, or I could stay home and watch them, you know. Awesome, awesome. Would... Twins will do that for you. <laughs> yeah, so that's good to hear. That's good to hear. So we've recently had a lot of discussions on Facebook, and uh, you're very good at pushing back on some of the things that I say and uh, having really good discussions. And I've been wanting you on the show for a while because you're very, very intelligent and you have a lot of information that you like to, you know, put out there. So that's the kind of conversations that I like to have. So as we stand, and I'll leave it off on kind of what the last thing we were talking about as far as the Republican Party and the Democrat Party. And I guess in your eyes, you said the Democrat Party is much less evil as the Republican Party is? I wouldn't, I don't want to call the word evil, but... Um... I would say, actually, the interesting thing is I think the Democratic Party is more diverse in every sense of the word, ideologically, um, demographically, everything. Um, and they are always trying to hold together this diverse coalition. And so a lot of their outreach to different groups of voters who have different interests, I think from the perspective of Republicans or conservatives can look like pandering or can look like playing identity politics. But when, in reality, what they're trying to do is they're trying to build a platform that's like a, a middle ground or compromise among these different groups that have different things that they're interested in. Whereas with Republicans, it's a much more homogeneous group of people overall. And, and I mean, not, not just demographically, but ideologically too. So for them, it's very much about let's promote our ideological agenda, whereas for Democrats, it's more like, let's hold this coalition together and achieve these policy aims, as many as we can, that will keep our coalition together. Okay. Um, and uh, a lot of the misperceptions that they have of each other is because they're trying to understand one another through the lens of how they see their own party. Hmm. You know, I, don't th I don't think Democrats are as ideological as Republicans think they are. I think that's kind of projection. I think there's a, I think there's a divide on the Democrat party between what some would consider liberals and leftists there there are yeah. the extremes and there are the extremes on the on the right as well and i'm not yeah. going to try to ignore that fact um but there's a there's a, a a very strong let's say tension between those two parties in the democrat party and i guess sometimes they get conflated so if i say liberals sometimes i'm talking about leftists and people are very confused about the, the difference between the two. Um, and that's where the Republicans and the people on the right get their fuel from. Because right. we can say, look at those Democrats. They support, you know, cracking down on free speech. They support, you know, identity politics, whereas everything is about your identity and not about diversity of thought. Well, let, me, let, me, let me push back a little bit there. I, I think if you're, you're watching American politics and you almost have to come to the conclusion that it's all about identity. I mean, everything about Trump is about people, people who feel like their identity is devalued, voted for Trump. 
a lot of them did. You know, if you are Christian and you think there's a war on Christmas and that, you know, uh, that the, the society went down the tubes because we, we kicked Jesus out of school, like that's identity politics. When you, when you play to people who feel that way, that's identity politics too. Okay. Yeah, of course and it is. It's not something that just the left does. Yeah. It's left and right because you cannot escape the concept of identity when you are doing politics. Yeah, which, which I, one of the reasons that I consider myself conservative is because I'm very, I'm very focused on the individual. And I, I think <laughs> Democrats tend to be more focused on the collective more so than the actual individual. And like you said, yeah, although we have so much protest around the country because of an individual, George Floyd, right? I I don't necessarily think that's what it is. I I honestly think that this is something much broader than just George Floyd. Um, for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement is supposed to be about Black Lives Matter, which I'm pretty sure that's what they're fighting for. But there are a lot of Black lives being ruined right now because of the protests and because of the rioters. I'm not conflating the two. There are the peaceful protesters and there are the rioters. Mm -hmm. And the rioters are using the protests as a cover to do what they're doing. Well, let me step back because um, we, we we're supposed to be talking about um, the political system and how to reform yeah. it. So I want to get yeah. derailed onto the Appreciate the that. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I do think it's a false choice to say, well, Republicans are focused all on the individual and Democrats are focused all on the collective. I think no political party and no political platform can ignore the fact that we are a country that has a, that is founded on the concept of certain individual rights, but at the same time that we all live within a set of institutions that incentivize or disincentivize certain choices. And the, the laws that we pass affect how we as individuals assess the choices that we ought to make. And so when, we, when we're having a conversation about policy, you shouldn't say, oh, you're focused on the collective or, oh, you're focused on the individual. You're focused on how does an individual navigate the structures that we have erected and that the condition, the incentives that they will face when they're coming to make their choices. I think that's really what the focus should be on. I think that's what the focus, of, you know, um, again, I, to bring it back to the point I was making before, with Democrats, I don't think it's so much about ideology because I don't think most Democrats who are in office right now are among the progressive, the high, like the leftist group that you described. There are, there are some, but like, I think most of them are like the old school liberals who are kind of wonkish and focused on policy. Not to say that leftists aren't focused on policy or aren't wonkish, they are. Um, but they're kind of pushing the envelope on, on policies that haven't been tried before. And I think we should listen because there's probably some merit in some of these new policy ideas. But again, it comes down to most people in the Democratic Party, whether they're old school liberals or whether they're progressives, they're really interested in policies and how policies affect individuals within the context of those institutions that they have to navigate. Yeah, okay. So it's kind of hard to have this conversation without focusing on some of the actual policy recommendations from each side. And, but I wanted to, okay, go ahead. I wanted to step back and just say like, but if we're talking about like reforming the political system, cause you know, we, we've talked about this before you felt like it just, nothing changes. Like yeah. Just the, yeah. The time we like, keep having to vote in the lesser of two evils constantly. Yeah. We and, back and forth. Right. Yeah. And then the other part, and nothing ever happens. And, um, and I think the problem is that we have a system where, um, for one thing, who gets elected doesn't really, is not the outcome of a really competitive process. You know, you and I, I'm sure that you feel, and I would actually agree with you, that like a market economy is better than a command economy because there's competition. Yeah. And businesses have to up their game and appeal to consumers and lower their prices and improve their quality or else they just go extinct. At least that's in theory how it ought to work. It yes. doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you get monopolists and they have to actually do the hard work, right? Sometimes you get regulatory capture and the people who are running the businesses are also setting the regulations and then like it's the fox guarding the hen house. And then again, you don't have people being responsive to consumers. 
But in theory, the market is better than a command economy because it's responsive. So by the same logic, in theory, a political system is going to be better the more responsive it is to voters. But the problem in America right now is that the political system isn't very responsive. Something like between 80 to 90 percent of, of U.S. House seats aren't even competitive. Yeah. Like the competition, if there is any at all, is in the primary. And a lot of times candidates run unopposed. So yeah. Can you imagine? Like, how are you going to have a government that's responsive to the people when 80, 90 percent of the people working there don't even have to worry about what the people think? <laughs> you know, this is this is something that goes back to the way the system is actually set up. And we have like the electoral college and we have like popular vote. And yeah. the the one of the reasons that I, I'm torn between these two places when it comes to the actual system. One is democracy is only as good as the voters. Mm -hmm. If you have a population of voters who are not educated or not well informed, this this goes back to what kind of information we're getting. We're, we're living in a, a day and age where you can find information to back up two separate positions that are directly opposed to each other. And the, the second thing is, do you actually want the majority to choose who goes in office? And this is something that the founders wrestled with. It was because a democracy is good if you can keep it. And if your voters are not well informed, you end up with populism. Whoever's the most popular, you know, is the one who gets the seat. Well, I hear you and agree that people ought to be more responsible in their, in their civic duties um, and to stay informed. Uh, but the problem with, with saying, I think the, the, I, I, where I see you going is kind of where like, you know, someone like Buckley would, would go, which is to say, you thought too many people had the right to vote. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think the answer lies in disenfranchising people. I think the answer lies in increasing our expectations for each other and, and how engaged and informed we ought to be. Because the problem is when you start targeting groups of people and saying you can't vote because you didn't meet certain criteria, those criteria are going to be abused by the people who have power to keep other people out. And yeah. they were in the past, and we know that was the case. Definitely. So once we say you can't discriminate on the basis of income, you can't discriminate on the basis of sex or religion, um, you can't dis discriminate on the, on the basis of you know, something like that. If you're a, an adult in this country, you have a right to weigh in. But now we have to increase our expectation for you, you know? And I yeah. think when we, have, when we create a system where people, can, they're not stupid, they can see that their vote doesn't really matter a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Well, then they're, gun, they're not going to engage, you know? It's a double-edged sword. If you, live in a, if you live in a swing state, then come presidential election time, it's important if you vote. If you don't live in a swing state, people are like, eh, because I know where my state's going to land. It's either going to be a safe Democrat or a safe Republican vote. And like, what does it matter? So if you live in Ohio, great. If you live in uh, California, pff, sorry, your vote doesn't matter. You know, yeah. does that really the message we want to send people? Or that, like, that. again, uh, with the House of Representatives, like the, the, the Republican's going to win or the Democrat's going to win. It's just like 90% chance, you know, like, so what does it matter? Some ideas that have been floated around. And, you know, some ideas would require more structural change than others. So I'm going to try to, like, avoid ideas that would require a constitutional amendment because I just don't think that's going to happen. But if we're trying to be more realistic and, like, okay, what kinds of policies could we do? You could get rid of the Electoral College without a constitutional amendment. You could just, each state could, state by state, they could pass the National Popular Vote Bill, which just basically says, the state government says, we will give our electoral college votes to whoever won the national popular vote. And once enough states uh, have, states that have, I guess it's 270 electoral votes in total, once it, uh, uh, enough states with that many uh, electoral college votes between them have passed this, then you would effectively guarantee that the winner of the presidency would be the winner of the popular vote. So that's one thing you could do. I think that's a bad idea. I think that's a bad idea. I, I know you got oh. multiple points, but let me, let me clarify on that one. There, there, there are populations which, if you go to the actual popular vote, would, still we have the, a problem where they wouldn't even matter. Uh, I think there are like a handful of states that actually would choose the president every single time if you went to a popular vote. 
Georgia would not matter. You know, small states Georgia, would not matter. Georgia's, Georgia's the, but Georgia's a competitive state now. But the population, the, the, the population, the, it, Texas, New York, California, some of these places have such a large population that well, only Texas, they... Texas generally goes Republican. New York generally goes Democrat. Florida is a swing state, but it's tended towards Republican. California tends to go Democrat. But within California, even within California, it's still like 60-40. In other words, right now, 40% of Californians' votes don't matter. Uh, right now, mm -hmm. I think it's like 55-45 in Texas, maybe. So 45% of Texas voters don't matter. You're saying people wouldn't matter. But actually, it isn't just the, um, the big states. I mean, big states kind of get, some of the biggest states, because they're safe one way or the other, get ignored. Small states get ignored right now. Well, I mean, because the swing states. Waste, why are you going to waste time in Wyoming when you know which way it's going to go? Why would you waste time in a popular vote when you can just go to the biggest states and ignore the small states because with the small population? Bad, because actually, and if you go and look this up, that's not enough votes to win for you. It's not. Because it's, it's not the case that the, the Democrat gets 100% of the votes in California or that the Republican gets 100% of the votes in Texas. Because they're split relatively, not, not very evenly, but 60-40 is not you know, such a massive difference that, that you could afford to ignore other states. You can't. You cannot win the presidency with just a handful of states. Well, also, you, how, we got 50 states and we, uh, and we got territories. Now, are you, are you saying that if we go to the popular vote, then every president, presidential camp, um, candidate would have to go to every single last state and actually campaign, then that goes back that's to up, funding. Well, that's up to them. And well, honestly, you know, you can you can choose how much you want to spend in which state you want to devote to. Um, but right now, most candidates do at least make one appearance uh, during the primary and during the general election in every state or territory. I don't know if they always go to all the territories, but in every state, they usually make at least one appearance. Um, so I don't know. And I think, you know, if you want to talk about reigning and spending, that's a, that's a good, we gotta, we gotta touch that. We got, we gotta yeah, we touch, touch that. that. But, but, you know, like, I don't know that like the travel expenses of the candidates going around to, to meet people in person in each of these States are as big as the advertising budgets. And I also would say that even if it costs a lot of money for them to travel around, those face-to-face -face interactions between the candidates and the people are a much better way for voters to get informed and engaged than for them to passively watch an ad on TV. Um, so let, me you, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. Um, this is this is something I also think about when I think about the popular vote. Let's say ninety percent of the country mm -hmm. decides that we want to get rid of the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Just hypothetically speaking. The majority wins. There are cases where the majority are wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, the, and how do you account for that? that without the constitutional amendment, though, right? The yeah. First amendment, again, definition, like, so in, that would require. So, I mean, you raise an interesting question, which is. Um, how do you keep the majority from, over, from dominating well, what the we're minority? What I'm saying is the, the, the Constitution prescribes a, a, a uh, process for amendment right <clears throat> if you follow that process you can't claim maybe you could say that it was unwise but you can't say that it was legally constitutionally wrong you know and i don't believe you know i think there's probably a number of ideas that would benefit the constitution that you are never going to get people to pass because we're pretty conservative as a country when it comes to our constitution we're not you know regardless of how conservative we are in general and other um, policy matters, when it comes to the Constitution itself and our respect for that document, we are very conservative. Even liberals are, are wary about tinkering with the Constitution. Yeah. Like if you so, look at Canada, Canada I just... see any possibility yeah. of the First Amendment being repealed <laughs> just because <laughs> it would take so much support that will never materialize. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
Well, but, uh, to my point earlier about the, you know, the, with the popular vote for president, the idea is it makes every vote matter. It makes every state matter. And it makes the outcome appear, at least appear, more legitimate. You don't have situations where people feel disenfranchised because the outcome ran counter to what the majority of people wanted. That's happened twice in my lifetime now. It seems like we're heading in a direction where, unfortunately, the Republican Party has to rely on the Electoral College if it wants to continue winning elections. And that's a problem because, again, we get back to this idea of accountability, responsiveness. If you know that you can win with a minority of support and you can say F you to a majority of, of Americans, that is not the recipe for a responsive, competent leadership, you know? Mm. And it's not just with the presidency. Like, that gets a lot of airtime, a lot of press, because we, the president is sort of like the symbol or the figurehead of the nation. But just as important, if not more important, is the legislature. I don't know That's if you're funny. aware, but like in 2018, three states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina, three states, Democratic candidates for the House got more votes than Republican candidates for the House, but the Republicans won more seats in those states' House delegations. I think North Carolina got like 10 out of 13. Mm. And this was, they were challenged uh, uh, in court over the gerrymandering that created these districts. And I think uh, one of the judges asked uh, the, North, the, the guy who represented North Carolina who drew the map, like, uh, how is it that, you know, you could <laughs> get 10 seats without even getting a majority of the vote or something like that? And he was like, well, because I couldn't draw a map that would give us 11. <laughs> his, his sole goal was how can I rig the design of these districts so that we can win even if we lose? You know, that's a, the that's a, that's a thing that I want to touch on because are we are we acting under the impression that Democrats don't gerrymander or Democrats well, don't? They do, but the thing is that they, they do. But what you have to understand is that gerrymandering mainly benefits rural voters over urban voters. It's very easy to pack and crack. You know, you, you've heard of these expressions before: packing and cracking. Mm -hmm. You pack people into a district, or you break them up and, and put them put a small minority of people. I suffer them. from that myself. You'll be amazed how cookie cut it. Yeah, it's so much more. It's so much easier to pack and crack urban populations than rural populations because the urban populations are densely, you know, uh, organized, right? Yeah, and just urban populations tend to vote much more heavily for Democrats. So while it is true that states, in like for example, in Maryland, Democrats have gerrymandered successfully. Maryland is a small state, and a lot of Maryland is urban. So it's easy to do that. But most of the country uh, is not as densely populated as Maryland. And so it is just far, far easier in state after state after state for Republicans to gerrymander successfully, right? But I don't think we should have gerrymandering at all. And you know, when I lived in Virginia, you know, I was, I signed a petition in uh, support of, a, of, a, of a, a group called One Virginia, which supports nonpartisan non -partisan redistricting. So don't let the politicians choose their voters. Have it done by an independent panel of demographers and geographers and people who do not have affiliations with either party. Or with yeah. party. Um, and then have that, have what they uh, design approved by judges, you know. Right now we have some oversight in some states where judges have to approve the maps that are drawn by political parties. But again, it's like it's it's a it's a pretty thin veneer of of accountability, and a lot of times they're just a rubber stamp. Uh, yeah, I think I think that I think what a lot of people may not know, or they may know, but there are a lot of conservatives who are not happy with the Republican Party. They haven't been happy with the Republican Party for years. I mean, that 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 I, that's kind of how you get Trump. I don't. Mm -hmm. Part of it was a referendum on the Republican Party because a lot of the Republican voters were like, y'all aren't representing us. And Trump came and just took over the party. You don't have that if the voters are already satisfied with their party. Mm -hmm. And 
So what do you think it was about the Republican Party that, that what they weren't representing people? Because the Republican parties don't pass policies that are conservative. They, they don't, I mean, they talk about small government, for instance, but they never, they never really act on small government. They, they expand the debt. They, you know, spend where they shouldn't spend, big budgets. And real conservatives don't want massive spending, especially on certain programs and stuff like that, where, I mean, look at Trump right now. Trump is not really making the government smaller. He's cut regulations and he's, you know, dialed back on some of the policies. But for the most part, he's still expanding his power. Just look at what he did with Twitter. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, and also the Space Force creating a brand new government agency, which didn't exist before. I mean, that's expanding the size of the government. Right? Exactly. Really that, that's not conservative. And I, I talk to Democrats or liberals all the time who are not happy with the Democrats either, but they're more unhappy with the re Republicans. But they're not happy with the money. Like, like a lot of our representatives are being bought out. Um, it's a well-known fact that what people really want, they're not getting. What we really agree on, that's not the policy that's being passed. It aligns with the millionaires and billionaires and what they actually want. And yeah. I think that is the biggest problem we face in our system right now, is big money in politics. I, I agree with you. Um, I think there's, we've got to find some ways to, to address the legalized corruption. Um, you know, I, I do want to circle back eventually to some other reforms for uh, elections and for the legislature, okay. but just to make points to address what you just said about the money. I mean, you've seen that story in the news recently about those senators, four senators, three Republicans, one Democrat, who were accused of insider trading. Yeah, during the COVID-19. It, it boggles my mind that you can be an elected member of Congress at the federal level or at the state level and have the right to, to buy and sell individual stocks while you are in office. I think when you, when you the moment you, you take that oath of office, okay, your funds should be invested in some kind of a, a you know, a blind trust or uh, like a, you know, we have these, index funds, which are great. And most of my retirement is in index funds yeah. because they track the market and they, they usually have a balance. You can do, you know, 60, 40 with equities versus uh, bonds if you want, yeah. depending on your risk preference, right? But the point is that it's the, it's the fund manager who buys and sells the assets in there, right? So mm -hmm. there's no question of me having any conflict. Like if I was working for some company, there'd be no question of a conflict of interest because I'm not in, I'm not in control. And I just feel like for the time that you are in office, you, your assets should be in some kind of a, an index fund and you can adjust it, the, the proportion of equities to bonds based on your, you know, risk preference. But it should be in that kind of an, an investment vehicle so that you are, your interests are aligned with the interests of all Americans because you're, if the market goes up, your asset values go up. If it goes down, your asset values go down. Yeah. You know, you're not trading on insider information. You're not or short, short, manipulating short, policies to American market. Yeah, or manipulating policies to exactly. favor one market over the other. Because you wouldn't benefit from that. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So I just feel like that's that'd be an easy thing to change. But when we try to do it, a lot of politicians refuse to go along with it. I think Richard Burr, who was this one who's he's, he's the only one who's still under investigation, he opposed the Stock Act, which was the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge. That was the acronym. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was it was designed to, to prevent the use of non-public information to uh, um, to make a profit. And I, I think they're going to find a loophole around that, even if we were we were to pass that, because I, I I'm very familiar with mutual funds, index funds, you know, portfolios where it's managed by the um, people that are completely not connected from you. But politicians have a way of networking and pick up the phone and say, hey, man, this is about to happen. You run my portfolio. I need you to make some changes. You know? Yeah. That it, <sighs> well, if you, that's the problem with having it like in a, in, a, in a trust. If you're holding on to individual stocks and stuff, yeah, you're right. You don't have to initiate the trade. You could have someone else trade for you. But if it's in a, a fund where um, you have no control, you can't, I can't call up the fund manager of Vanguard, you know, and tell him, hey, I really want you, because he's got 
billions and billions under management belonging mostly to people who are not me. <laughs> so he can't go and buy himself because I called and told him to, you know what I mean? So, and I don't think even he could if, if it was, a, you know, some senator because that just represents a drop in the bucket of the fund that he or she is managing. Um, so, yeah. yeah, but that's not the only thing you could do. I mean, you could put, put some restrictions on lobbying. I was just about to say that lobbying has to be really can be a lobbyist or something like that. Yeah, you have to restrict lobbying. Um, to a, there, there, there's this there's this split between just because you run a company, should you not be able to get involved politically, and should you not be able to use the money that you have to push for policies? Because I'm pretty sure if I gave you a million dollars right now, you might invest some of that money into actually pushing some of the policies you agree with. But there has to be a cap. Uh, enough of a cap to dissuade politicians from completely ignoring majority of the voters. Yeah, I, I don't want to say that lobbying is all bad because a lot of lobbyists are experts in their field and politicians should listen to them. But the problem is that there are oftentimes many other stakeholders who don't have the budgets that lobbying firms have you know, or industry firms. And so they don't get as much time mm -hmm. with our elected representatives. And so if it's kind of an availability, but if this is the people that you spend time with. These are the people who you're talking to. You're going to begin to frame your understanding of policy issues in, in accordance with the frame that they've given you. Yeah. You haven't heard from other stakeholders who have a different way of looking at it because they have a different experience with the problem. So there needs to be, you know, you can think of it as like an equal time rule. Remember the equal time rule on TV, which was that you had to give equal time to various viewpoints and we got rid yeah. of that. But I feel like we kind of need a congressional equal time rule where Congress members need to be exposed to different points of view that aren't just the ones from the well-funded lobbyists. You know? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard for average people to compete with millionaires and billionaires. It, it, exactly. It, it, it's sad and it's, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. I think one something we can do, and just to try to segue back to the conversation we were having about uh, about how to improve the way we do elections. Um, one thing that I think powerful industry groups or lobbying groups can often do or, or PACs do is that they is they use um, advertising, political advertising, to try to get the public to frame, for, you know, uh, issues the way they want to see it framed. And a lot of that is negative, attacking candidates. Yeah. And I kind of feel like if we had a different way of choosing our elected representatives, we might, you might see different ways of trying to appeal to voters. So, for example, um, some states have experimented with something called ranked choice. You know, yeah, this? yeah, I've heard of this. I, I think it's an interesting idea. Um, so, with ranked choice, one of the one of the big benefits of it, well, a couple of big benefits, you encourage third parties, which right now third parties are basically spoilers. If you vote for a third party in an otherwise competitive race, you're almost certainly harming the candidate who is closer to you ideologically even if he's not like your perfect choice yeah um, but if he was ranked choice then third party vote third parties could conceivably win seats because in, in some districts they are people's they're not everyone's first choice maybe but there are many many more people's second choice and more popular overall than the other two parties the other major parties right yeah um, it may be a lot of people's first choice, who knows, but the, they can get past, like they might get, you know, only 20% of the first choice votes, but they get like 80% of the second choice votes, whereas the other candidates can't muster that. And so, so anyway, third parties would have a, a better chance in that situation. But another important thing that happens when you have the ranked choice voting is that candidates care about being your second choice. They're like, maybe... I'm not going to be your first choice. I understand that. But let me show you why I think I'd be a good candidate, even if you couldn't get your first choice. And that encourages positive campaigns. You know, yeah. the negative, negativity and the smearing and the, 
um, the stuff that really turns off voters and, and encourages this attitude of like, it's all broken and they're all just crooks and liars, that would start to turn around, I think. Yeah, and right now we have, I'm pretty sure, I, I really believe that we have the third parties actually being manipulated to actually hurt other candidates. It was like, you know, if I'm a Republican, I could easily find somebody to run independent close to Joe Biden and try to steal votes away from him. It, it, it's possible that it could be manipulated like that. Politics are, these politicians are very smart and very crafty on how to get the upper hand on their opponent. Um, what do you say about, because I know you want to get back into the conversation about, um, uh, we were talking about before we got into the money situation. We were talking about um, it was a point you had, college? yeah, the electoral college. Um, well, not just the, in any election law reforms, reforming how we choose our representatives to make because we got com we got started in this conversation with the idea of accountability and responsiveness. We got because we said market economies better than command economies because they're more responsive and accountable. Yeah. Political systems, same principle. They need to be accountable and responsive to the people. So how do we have elections where we are encouraging people to participate, encouraging people to be informed, and forcing politicians to actually earn our votes rather than take them for granted? All right. Mm -hmm. And then if we had if we had that situation, then I think um, for one thing, politicians would work harder to pass bills that the public supports. Like right now, um, there is a large, pretty large majority of people who think that marijuana possession should be decriminalized. Definitely. Where is that happening? You know, like, at the federal level and in so many states, it's not happening yet. You know? Um, and conservatives, liberals, independents, everybody, for the most part, I can't find anybody who disagrees with it at this moment except a small minority group of people. But it again, just that's doesn't... That's actually one example of the, of the failure of our current system to produce people who are listening to voters and doing what the voters want. Um, it also goes back to this mentality of they elected me, I know what's best for them. Yeah. You know, a lot of politicians feel like they know what's better for the people than the people actually do. And I, 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 I tend to think of it as bottom up because I really feel like voters allow these things to take place because we're the majority. We are the people. And we've sold ourselves out to allowing the government to tell us what we should think, allowing the government to tell us how we should behave. I mean, public schools are failing. We have to find a way to improve public schools. That goes back to being informed voters and knowing what's going on in your, in your government and knowing how to change it and how to build coalitions and, you know, work together to fix it. It's just not enough people willing to work together. I might compromise some things with you if we can reform the government. You know, I might give up 10 things and you might have to give up 10 things, but we meet in the middle and say, okay, Let's do this, but let's work together to reform the system. As long as we're fighting each other, this is what politicians know. As long as we're bickering back and forth over Republican versus Democrat, they got us right where they want us at. Yeah. Well, the, to get back to that point that you made at the beginning about how um, people feel so frustrated, that's, that's a lot of these electoral reforms that I'm talking about. The aim is to increase people's engagement. If you had ranked choice voting and politicians had to be more positive in their campaigning. Maybe so many people wouldn't be turned off and just throw their hands up and say, it's all, you know, yeah. so if, if you feel like your vote matters because it actually makes a difference. And if you feel like what you're hearing from your politicians is actual ideas that could be put into practice instead of just smearing the other guy, you will be more likely to go out and vote. And when you go vote, you will have, be more likely to have actually read up about the issues and have thought about them instead of just voting against whoever you don't like right now. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I kind of appreciate, I kind of appreciate knowing my choices, bad policies in the past or things that they've done. I, I, I kind of care less about personal life. Like 
what Bernie Sanders does and his personal life has nothing to do with policies he supported and voted for in the past and his kind of record. You know, I think the smears come from personal life, like, you know, going after Joe Biden's son or something like that. I think not 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 going after Joe Biden and his son and Burisma, but more on the aspect of his son is a drug addict or his son has a baby mama here. Like that that has nothing to do with politics. You know, that's just a complete smear. You know? Yeah, and I think we pretty much established now that the public doesn't really care about these scandals that much because they don't seem to affect the popularity. Look at, look at Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, they don't seem to have an impact. So I don't know why we keep talking about them, but I think it's because they, they're used to a playbook where that's what they do um, because it's more about energizing your, your base, a small percentage of voters to make sure they come out because you don't really have to make a broad appeal. You know, mm -hmm. you just need to get past the finish line uh, that 50% plus one. Yeah. And, and the extremes have the loudest voices. They, they are the ones. I said before, we, we were talking about individualism versus the collectivism attitude. And I, and I, I said that really what it is, it's about understanding how individuals make choices within structures, institutions. Politicians, I think, you know, I, I, I've been coming down on them for most of this show, but I wanna, and here I'll make a, a brief defense of the way politicians behave. In a way, they are responding rationally to the incentives of the political structure that we have given them. Yes. And if we want them to make better choices as individuals, we need to change the incentives. Right now, we are incentivizing negative campaigning and uh, just ginning up your base and um, narrow appeals. Exactly. And only listening to lobbyists. And so we are incentivizing that with our choices. That's what I was saying about the voters and the, the mass population of it. We're allowing this. We're, we're sitting around watching it. And I know people who complain about it on all sides. And I'm like, if we all agree that there's a problem, why aren't we getting together to fix it? That, that, that. So here, we've gone through a list of uh, uh, nonpartisan redistricting would be helpful. Um, ranked choice voting would be helpful. Um, fixing the lobbying and fixing the money in politics. Yeah, addressing um, any any semblance or appearance of corruption needs to be addressed. Um, another idea, um, so I, uh, I had this course in college on um, third world politics and, and, and we were focused there a lot on, um, on institutions because we were studying countries that had just recently come out from under the yoke of colonialism and they were trying to build stable institutions for themselves. And so um, my teacher gave me this book to read uh, called Patterns of Democracy mm -hmm. by Aaron Leipart, which I highly recommend uh, to you and your viewers. Uh, it's really interesting. It's a study of like 27 different democracies across the developing world and developed world. And, uh, and he's looking at the institutions and what works well. And um, <clears throat> He did find, and this is a kind of change that you couldn't make in America without a constitutional amendment, but he did find that like parliamentary systems where the executive is chosen from the majority party in the legislature mm. tend to be more responsive. That is, they tend to have a higher approval rating from the people because they tend to do what they say they're going to do. You don't have a situation where, you know, you have a president of one party and a, a majority in the legislature it's another party and then they just it's gridlock and everybody gets pissed off because nothing happens you know that brings me back because I, I was reading the federalist papers and part of what the founders wanted they they didn't mind gridlock because they didn't want people to be able to change things so fast they didn't want it to just be like oh we they feel this political parties either they didn't foresee partisanship and tribalism yeah they tried to set up the system to where everything balanced itself out, but yet they couldn't I don't possibly. Think they, I don't think they foresaw a situation where members of a political party would blindly obey the leadership of their party and just refuse to cooperate. They foresaw individuals in Congress negotiating with one another, hashing it out. But instead, what we have is parties where if the leadership says jump, the members say how high. And... <laughs> So they don't have any incentive to work together because, again, 
it hurts them electorally to be seen cooperating with the enemy. Yeah. Right? Because they're just worried about their base showing up to vote. They're just they're worried about getting primaried, right, by someone who's more extreme, right? Yeah. So all the incentives are towards uh, complete dysfunction. You know, that's that's I don't think the framers foresaw that happening. No, and not fact, at all. They warned, about, they warned about faction, what they called faction, which by, what they meant by that a political party. Yeah. But political, but they may have been naive to think that political parties wouldn't simply form organically. You know, I don't think I think if we burned it all to the ground and started over, it wouldn't be very long before political parties arose again. Yeah, and also, so way, yeah. also, um. There used to be a time where you could walk up to the president's house and knock on the door and have a conversation with the president. You know, it's just things have the the four the founders could have not have seen where we've come. It's just it's just so much that's going on right now. We have to find a way. What's good? What do we keep? And what do we take away? Well, one idea we could implement, which would not require a constitutional amendment, is simply increasing the size of the House of Representatives. Um, in that book that I was telling you about, Patterns of Democracy, he, he found that legislatures, whether the system was a presidential system or a parliamentary system, the legislatures tended to be more responsive to the people's wishes when the size of the legislature bore a certain purport, a ratio to the population of the country as a whole. And, and he called it the cube root rule. So basically, take the population of the country and then take the cube root of that number, mm. and that's roughly the size of the of the congress that you want or the parliament mm. um up to a point like in the united states right now it's 435 members if you took the cube root of our population it'd, it'd be more like 675 or something like that so it'd be, it'd be adding it'd be like increasing by 50 percent the size of our congress that might be a little bit too much or they'd have to have a new facility because i don't think you could fit that many desks in the current yeah year. but i'd like to look into that yeah yeah Look up the cube root rule for uh, uh, legislatures. The point is that when you have more districts like that, um, there, there's there's less gerrymandering for one thing, and there's and and more participation from people and and more diverse. Um, because uh, you have enough people to to actually get out and address and interact with the people, yeah. find out what they want, and yeah, bring exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. Right now, you've got to represent like minimum three hundred thousand people, but you know, I think it's in some a little bit more than that but yeah so you you would have a smaller constituency um more easy access to your representative um your representative probably represents a a uh a more contiguous um region than the like crazy districts that we've drawn now you know yeah um, so yeah the, <clears throat> but, um so yeah that, that's one idea the ranked choice voting is another one idea that would probably require um, a constitutional amendment, um, unless it was done state by state, uh, would be called proportional representation, where um, some countries like Germany have this, uh, where you vote for a party rather than a candidate. Uh, and then what happens is they'll, they'll tally up all the votes that the various parties get, and then they will allocate seats in the, in the legislature based on the percentage that they got. So like right now, you have to win 50% of the votes in your district to win a seat. But under a proportional representation system, like if you live in a state like um, North Carolina, let's say the Democrats won 40% um, of the vote, the Republicans won 40% of the vote, and then like some Libertarians won 10% and the Greens won another 10%. So then you would actually apportion it out like, you know, six, uh, or let's say five seats for the oh. Democrats, five seats for the Republicans, it's like having so, stock in a company. It's kind of like yeah, basically. So like, so what would happen then is even if the even if the libertarians or the greens couldn't win fifty percent of the votes in any district, because they still got ten percent of the vote, they're out. They're entitled to ten percent of the seats. Yeah, and that would break the grip of the two party duopoly, because now in some states. Uh, and hopefully in the Congress, those the two major parties wouldn't be able to control a majority unless they reached out to third parties mm. to form a coalition. Mm. In many other democracies, like Germany, like Israel, a lot of places in, in Europe, uh, you you have you have to build these coalitions. 
um, after the election is over. Yeah, I know like Israel, Israel does that. They're Israel, they have to build coalition amongst other parties in order to get the majority. Um, yeah, that, that that's something that I've been thinking about. Uh, it may not be necessarily, you know, exactly how they do it. Um, but like you said, that will, that will have to cause a, like a constitutional amendment and we would have to uh, figure out a way to do it in the American context. It's, 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 to me, it's, a, it's an interesting constitutional question. I don't know if it's ever been answered, whether, whether the, constitutional, the Constitution guarantees uh, the, the, the citizens of every state a, a Republican form of government. By which they simply mean, you know, the republic, Republican in the sense that in the 18th century was a, a government where you get to elect your representatives. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the question is, would proportional representation, where you vote for parties rather than people, would that qualify? And that is the question of constitutional interpretation, maybe. And I'm not sure which way they would come down. Um, but so it maybe wouldn't require a constitutional amendment. Um, you're breaking up again kind of um, but yeah I think that's a good place to leave it I think that gives us a lot to actually think about uh, a lot of pro uh, proposals that we as Americans should be focused on and trying to figure out these solutions and man maybe one day you can run for office man <laughs> you know uh, sometimes the best way to make change is to get in there and do it yourself so uh Thank you, Dustin, so much for doing this with me. Thank you so much for having this conversation. Anything you want to plug or anything you want to say before we go? Uh, no, I mean, uh, it, we, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, actually, um, um, I mean, we've talked about the, uh, I wrote a book a few years ago called Truth Evolves, which was a work, it's a work of philosophy, but the, the second half of the book is a lot about moral and political philosophy and actually a lot of the topics we've been discussing today about you know how to make political institutions more adaptive more responsive is are things that i've talked about in that book um, so if you're interested in that then there's also you know um well, i've had a lot of sources in there that you might be interested in reading including the book by leipart uh aaron leipart l-i-j-p-h-a-r-t it's called patterns of democracy very interesting read so check that out okay uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for having me on. Happy, um, happy to do it. Not a problem. Go check his work out. You know, you can find Dustin Aaron on Facebook, and he's written a lot, a lot of articles. So look him up. You know, thank you so much, Dustin. They came, they heard, they saw, and I run. Tell them we said it. They asked for us by name. Make sure you said it twice. This is the Javier Javier Show. Mm -hmm.